point is to raise your family on a farm, man, you could go somewhere else and find something else that might be a lot easier and never see your family too. You got a friend. A lot of folks are struggling with employees. <laughs> Not anymore. I'm responsible. I am the steward of that animal. Amen. Sir, sir, do you have some time to talk, uh, to do an interview, sir? Sir, no, okay, he's too busy eating. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are here at Bostick, North Carolina, at Koufax Creek Farm with my friend, my beautiful, gorgeous, amazing, awesome pig farming friend, Aaron Bradley. How are you doing, Bradley? I'm doing great. I'm doing great, Ron. Good, good. Well, so Aaron, uh, you know, normally uh, when I talk with folks, especially people of faith, I have them just open us up in a prayer uh, before we get started the interview. Does that sound okay? That sounds great. Yeah. Cool. cool. Go for it. Uh, Lord, we just want to thank you for today, a beautiful day and beautiful weather. And uh, Lord, we just uh, ask that you would uh, just bless us as this, uh, during this time of fellowship and uh, just celebrating friendship and uh, talking about your blessings of farming. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would just uh, uh, just guide us to be good stewards of what you've blessed us with, Lord. In your name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. All right. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, I've known Aaron for probably, what, like two, three years at this point? Probably so. And I remember coming to the collaboration that you did. You know, I was like, oh, my goodness. This guy got uh, extension and a national port board involved, and he's doing regenerative practices. Uh, so I was just really impressed by what you had going on. And since then, I've just been a geek and a fan of yours and your farm. Uh, so tell tell the folks a little bit about yourself and what you're doing, uh, the history behind your farm, and you know why why you even got in the pigs. Out of all things, Aaron, why'd you get in the pigs? <laughs> well, the uh, fanship goes both ways. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, so uh, I I'm Aaron Bradley, uh, and uh, my wife and I own Colfax Creek Farm. Uh, like he said, we're here in Bostick, and um, yeah, we we got into pigs. We were doing cattle farming and uh, started. Uh, started helping my family out. They had, they had cattle and we wanted to find a way to, uh, to be able to kind of do our own thing and ended up buying seven pigs and man, it just, it went crazy from there. Changed your life, right? Changed our life. Yeah, it <laughs> sure did. Once you go pig, you can't go back. You don't, you mm. don't, man. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, good. Uh, so I guess like for you, what does it mean to be a profitable pig farmer? Uh, I've already done the tour mm -hmm. with just kind of the practices that you guys have going on over here. But I'm curious, like for you on a financial level, what does it mean to be profitable? You're at a scale where most people would be envious of you, I dare say. Um, you know, but for you on your ground level, what does it mean to be profitable? So the first thing that we really figure in is, you know, uh, quality of life is certainly something that we buy out of this. Um, so we, you know, you hear it and it's a true statement. Um, you know, you don't get into money or excuse me, you don't get into farming to make money. <laughs> yeah, wait, 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 wait. Say that one more time. One more time. <laughs> you, you know, people don't, it's not the most lucrative business. You're not going to get into something where you're going to get rich, but I don't think that many things can, can really compete with the quality of life that farming offers. Mm -hmm. Um, for us, you know, Cert we certainly want to be able to pay our bills and be able to do stuff. Uh, we want to be able to travel some and, you know, enjoy life. But uh, so being profitable, uh, it's about being frugal and it's about being able to appreciate what you have and, you know, living, living pretty modestly um, and just knowing that you can make up for those monetary things by enjoying what you have and the qu quality of life and the freedom that farming offers as well. So what does it mean to live modesty for, for you? What does that look like on a daily basis? So driving a little bit older truck, you know, wearing, uh, wearing the same old clothes, same old boots and stuff like that, I guess. But, uh, you know, just not doing anything too extravagant. We, we, you know, cook good food here at the house, but it saves us some money. Um, we, we use hand-me-down stuff and, you know, just try to upcycle things. Uh, just, just trying to, uh, appreciate what we have. And, and a big thing that we, that we do too is, you know, when we do spend money, it's in a, it's in a sense to try to make us money. If that, if that makes sense. So we prioritize those things. There's a lot of things that we want. Um, but at this point in our business and in our life, we're really trying to invest into things that will help grow the business. And that lifestyle change in that viewpoint, I feel like is, is certainly important for financial success in farming is understanding that you may have to sacrifice some things for a certain amount of time. Um, you may not be able to, to take that trip or, you know, do some of the recreational activities that you may want to do the more expensive ones at that time. 
instead of spending the money to do those th- those things, you just put it back in your farming business. Uh, amen, <laughs> amen. One thing I love about um, your philosophy is the fact that you do value what you're doing more than the comforts of life. Uh, you know, I believe that. We weren't designed to live in comfort. But through adversity, we, we grow more as human beings. Uh, so hearing about the sacrifices that you've been making and how there are a lot of people that wouldn't make those sacrifices, even people who have an interest in you know wanting a homestead or wanting to be a production-based farm. Uh, and so just hearing like, you know what, I barely take vacations. So if you want to get into farming, just know, vacation's probably not going to be much of a thing. Now, I've met some people who raise pigs, and they're like, I just buy feeder pigs, and, you know, I sell holes and halves at this price, and at the end of the year, I got three months, four months, maybe even five months where I'm done. Yeah. Like, I just get to take a break. Um, and so for you, it's a little bit differently, but I just love the fact that you acknowledge that there is sacrifice that needs to be made. Sure. Um, and that that has built your character. So just talk about like what you've grown into since you first started, because uh, you started while also working, uh, yes, and now yeah. you are now he is full time, y'all. He is full time. So all you who dreaming about being full time farmers, listen up. He got something to say to you. All right, go for it. No, it's um, it's really about about knowing that end goal. You know, and, and for me, I wanted to farm full time and be able to make our living this way. And, and we're blessed. You know, my wife and I both are farming full time. We both less, less. Ooh, you got the <laughs> wife farming full time too. And, oh, and she's a full time mother, man. That's that's what that is a, a one of the highest priority things that we had. But knowing that's the goal is to end up on the farm full time and to be able to make my living here. When you see that and you prioritize that, certain things kind of fall into place and you push other things out of place, if that makes sense. Right. Um, you make those decisions based off of, is this going to help me achieve my goal or is this going to get in the way of it? Um, and then just adjusting uh, adjusting your lifestyle to that. But also, for us, it's been about being a really dynamic business when it comes, especially to our pork operation. You know, when we first started, we, we had the stalkers. And then knowing that if we wanted the farm full time, we were going to have to either find a supply of piglets or start to have to farrow ourselves. We couldn't find the supply of piglets, so we had to farrow. So, it, like you're saying, you know, that's a, it's more labor. It takes more time, and it, it's more of a commitment of being here. But that's what moved us closer to that goal. And uh, so as we've kind of shifted things around, you know, we've, we've often thought, man, it'd be great to find that supply of piglets. That would be awesome. Talk about envy. I envy the people that can sell those holes in halves and then take a few months off. You know, honestly, that, that sounds awesome to me. Um, but it's about finding, finding those opportunities and capitalizing on them um, that are going to help you achieve your goals. Because if you say that you just want to farm, you know, you can find a way to do that. And it can be, it can be pretty dynamic. Uh, but it, you got to find your end goals. You got to find what you enjoy. And then you have to find a way to make that work. And it may not always be when you would choose it or what you would choose, but if you're willing to make some sacrifices and adjustments, you can certainly reach your goal uh, by working hard with it. And just, just again, being dynamic with your operation. Amen. 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 <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yes, Praise sir. the Lord. All right. Um, you know, when you were talking about goals, the last thing I heard was being famous. Last thing I heard was uh, making guapo amount of money. What I heard was, I want my wife to be able to stay at home with my kid <laughs> and for me to, and for you to stay yeah. at home yeah. with your kid. That shows a lot of perspective. I think there are a lot of people that, oh, I just want to not work for somebody. Oh, I just want to get away from the system, right? But you're thinking more of like, I just want to make sure that I provide um, opportunity for my family to be a family, a high functioning family. I want to put that first. Hey, I'm inspired. I want to be just like you one day when I grow up. Um, you know, especially as someone who used to farm and will go back into farming. Um, you know, I don't know when marriage and kids are going to come in between that, but I have to think about what kind of farming dream business I want to have and how does family fit into that? You know, if I don't have a family starting out when I start farming again, you know, how do I incorporate my farm in a way where it can grow with that in mind? Yes, sir. Uh, so I think you thinking more upper echelon about the systems that you're creating 
families included in that. And I think that's something that a lot of farmers struggle with is how do I include family or how do I even include help? in farming you know people who uh, make their own systems they make systems that are really revolving around them most of the time and so then that equals to burnout equals to high levels of stress uh, when you do get an employee you don't know how to train them or teach them because everything is designed around you yes sir you um and so i've experienced that myself you know managing interns when i used to farm and how that affected me greatly and affected those interns so for you since you have employees y'all he got employees did you know that <laughs> um excellent employees employees i would vouch for you know since you have I agree since you have good employees talk about you know what it took for you to get to that level of being an employer Instead of just, you know, being your own employee, like you're at a level where you are a boss. Talk about what that transition was like for you and some of the ups and downs of dealing with that. You're absolutely right. I will 100 percent agree with you. We have uh, the best employees that I could imagine having. Um, And, you know, we talk about faith with this. It's getting out of your own way. Um, It is. Uh Oh, oh. it is something that (laughs) that uh, honestly, you know, we, we pray all the time about our business and, and, and for the Lord to let us be good stewards of the opportunities and give us wisdom to, to do what he would have us to do and to get out of our own way. And, um, you know, uh, earlier in 2021, we went through a period where we um, went from having a full staff of employees to, for a lot of different reasons, we went to where we were by ourselves. And uh, that's one of the things that I prayed is, you know, we, w- we were searching and we were posting and all this and uh, a lot of a lot of folks are struggling with employees. You got a friend. <laughs> a lot of folks are struggling with employees. <laughs> Not anymore. <laughs> um, during during this uh, with the pandemic and with everything else that's going on. And you know, we got to a point where we honestly said we're just gonna we're just gonna do what we can do, and we're we're gonna do our best at it. And when when the Lord wants us to have the right employees and have people come along, they'll come along. And I'm telling you, within a matter of about a month and a half after after we made that decision to just, it's going to work out like it should, these people came along. We They didn't see a job posting. They didn't see anything that we had. It was word of mouth. And uh, they just, they wanted to come out and, and give it a shot. And I'm telling you, they are, it, it's, it's incredible how it works. But uh, they don't come with a handbook. There's no doubt about that. Um, it is, it's, the, you know, we tell each other all the time, iron sharpens iron. And so, uh, to be a boss is, is one thing, but what we try to be is a team of leaders. And, and so we tell people when they come in, you know, different people are going to have different expertise and that level of expertise is going to vary with each individual, but regardless of how long somebody has been here or their official title or, you know, what their day-to-day responsibilities may be, we challenge people when they come in on day one to help make this place better. And we also understand that everybody's got to be humble enough that, you know, you, you can accept the criticism or you can accept, you know, knowing that, um, that we can always constantly improve. And I tell people every day that starts with me. I said, guys, men, women, you see me doing something and there's a better way to do it. Call me out. Tell me right then and there, you know, because that's the thing is, is we have to be able to understand that it is a bigger picture and we're moving each other forward. As we progress, we all do better. So that's the way that I look at it. But, you know, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun and it's, it's understanding different people's personalities and figuring out how we, we use a, a few different tools to figure out, you know, what people are really good at. Um, there's a, if you don't mind, what are some of those tools? You know, the disc, disc profile is a good one just to figure out about people's personality, to understand how they're going to approach different situations, the decision-making processes that they're going to use. And there's a few different ones that I'll tell us, you know, are people, are they really good at being idealistic? Are they really good at being just high functioning? Are they really good at, you know, just making sure that projects are followed through with and, and finished up the way that they should be? Um, and I tell people that on, on day one as well. I'll tell them, these are my weaknesses. I need you to understand that because I may need you to be a little stronger in that area to help carry me, you know. And I'll tell them, these are, this is what we're good at. This is what I, I feel like we're, uh, we're all performing well at. And what, I'm, what I need improvement with is, is what I tell them, you know, the better that you guys help me do, the better we all do. The better that I help you do, the better we all do. So it's all about just teamwork and employees. I, I, you said the word boss. In a sense, I hate that word because there's times that we have to manage. And there's times that, you know, 
I guess that at the end of the day, it, it is, you know, I could be called boss or something like that. But w- I want people to know that um, I think coach, mentor, leader is is a title that I want the, the leaders of this organization and, and this forum to carry and to challenge each other to carry that and to better themselves every day. So. Whew. Oh <laughs> man, uh, I, I could spend probably an hour just breaking all that down, and uh, we ain't got that much time. Um, so what I will say is, I, I love the honesty. I love the focus on humility of saying, "Hey, y'all, I'm not God. Not definitely ain't your God, you know. And I have weaknesses too. You know, you're here to not just help with my weaknesses as well, but I'm here to help with yours." Yeah. Uh, and so thinking of how do we develop more leaders as someone who's managed farms and have been a part of internships, one thing I've learned and I, I have some some angst against is how there are a lot of farms that have internship programs that aren't really developing leaders. They're just, uh, you know, as uh, Jordan Green would say, uh, a solution to a labor issue. Right. It's not really the best way of solving a labor issue is getting interns. You know, and so you found a way of developing leaders, um, developing young men and young women. Uh, I think the youngest one you got is still in high school, right? That's correct. Yeah, yeah, youngest one, and the the oldest one, he he he, he a grown man with a wife and kids. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> um, just turned fifty. Just turned just fifty. Just turned fifty. You know, and so it doesn't matter uh, what people's backgrounds are or anything like that. But you taking the time, this thing, the key part, you taking the time to actually analyze understand, see what their strengths and witnesses are, and see how you can complement that, see how they can complement you and your operation. Uh, I love that because that that is what defines a true leader from a boss or a manager. And there are a lot of people, even in the farming community, that are managers but aren't really leaders, aren't inspiring other leaders. Leaders develop, build, and inspire other leaders, and that's what you're doing here. Uh, so I love that. Also, y'all, I don't know if you caught this, but he said organization. This man did not say, not simply leave it at a farm, right? He's thinking big brain stuff, like I'm running a business, an actual business. Let's talk about that. Um, you know, with running a business with employees and constantly thinking about scaling up, how, how do you scale up or how do you pivot, how do you maneuver? What does it mean in your business to be flexible both to staffing issues as well as uh, market issues or processing issues which you know you and I have talked about a lot flexibility as a leader and a manager is um I think a lot of it has to do with showing vulnerability in yourself and and showing that you oh one more time say that one more time now (laughs) say say that to the folks right there so so it's showing that you are vulnerable um you're vulnerable to mistakes you're vulnerable to all the other things that us humans are vulnerable to uh too many times I feel like uh, quote unquote leaders are put themselves on a, on a platform. And I think that's more of a boss move to me of, you know, I may be the CEO or I may be, you know, whatever title that, that they have. And they don't necessarily display to the, the folks that make up their organization. Hey, I'm as vulnerable as you are. I make mistakes. I'm human. And, and it puts the employees in a position that they feel a lot of pressure and they feel like if I mess up, you know, that's the end of the world. I'm getting fired. This may happen. That may happen. And so flexibility with employees, I think, starts there to let them know, hey, if we are going to be successful as as an organization, that means that you will have to not only lead other other people within the organization, but different enterprises or just a specific task. And knowing that when we go out to do day-to-day stuff, flexibility means you can go out and I'm trusting you to make the decisions that will help us accomplish this task with no oversight and if you mess up, it happens. You did something. The only way that we're not going to mess up, the only way that we're not going to break something, the only way that things aren't going to go wrong is, I mean, I guess if we stay in the house all day, there's a better chance. If we keep the tractor in the shed, it's never going to get a scratch on it. You know, it's, it's just saying, hey, this is the goal that we're going to go tackle. We're all humans together. We're all leaders together. That's what we're challenging our, ourselves to be. And so let's go accomplish it together knowing that your way may be a little bit different than my way, and that's okay. It's just about that end result. It's about what we're moving toward. So, I mean, you, it doesn't really matter how, how it gets done as long as it's done in a proficient manner. 
and and that the end goal is the same, you know, is the way that we kind of look at it. So flexibility really lets employees be who they are and, and let their skill, sh- skill sets shine um, and, and not being too critical or um, – uh, micromanaging and, and things like that. You know, you, if you want to be successful, throw, throw all that stuff out the window. There's no time for it. Don't don't sweat the small stuff. Um, there's certain things that we do have to be particular in, but uh, you know, let people let people do what they do well. And the number one thing that I that I love with the business owner um, mentality is there should be nothing on on this farm. There should be nothing in my business that I'm the best at. If I'm the best at everything in my business, I'm failing as a business owner and a leader. There should be somebody here that can be that can do every task that needs to be accomplished on this farm better than I can. And if I don't build a team and, and uh, a, a group that can do those things, then I feel like I'm failing as a leader. And, and we all have that mentality. And, and creating the culture that we're trying to create here, we, we see that in others too. And we know that, hey, you know, this one individual may have been here longer than the other one, or, you know, they usually do this better or or whatever it may be, but I'm going to, I'm going to get out of their way and I'm going to push pride or any of that other stuff out of my way and let this person get in front of me while other people are watching and let them do a better job. That's, that's the greatest thing ever. Seeing that culture come together and seeing people do that is, is man, that's success in in, in my book. If you're static and you decide we're only going to have this is the plan. This is all that we're going to do. This is how we're going to accomplish it. It has to be done this way. You're setting yourself up for failure, I feel like, because there's so many different outside factors that are going to change your plan. And if you're not willing to be, um, if you're not willing to be flexible and, and not only willing to be, but if you're, if you don't find a way to cope with it and not, not let it stretch you out, it, it's man, it's a, it's a recipe for disaster. Um, because there's there's going to be things that go wrong. You can get that processing appointment. That's a big thing that livestock farmers that direct market product have struggled with over the last couple of years is is the processing. You can have that processing appointment and get a flat tire on the way to the processor. With the animals loaded, if you got them loaded, you know, I mean, we 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 canceled our first processing because we couldn't get the animals loaded. Man, it's, <laughs> that's, that's how it goes. Oh, when, when man. We, don't don't let them the good old days. <laughs> man, the I'll rookie tell you. amateur days, huh? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that's the thing is, that's an, that's another thing with, with being flexible in the way that you do things. And I look back at myself a year, two, three, throughout my farming career, I look back at myself and, and I, can, I can laugh at the way I would do things. Or I can be like, man, I thought that was the greatest thing ever. That was awful. And if I, I can't do that throughout my farming career... I'll feel like that's a failure as well. And so so if I'm not willing to always be flexible and change the way that we're doing things and, and grow, then, you know, I, I feel like it's it's pointless, you know. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> woo, woo, man, if this guy has not been refined through farming, I don't know who has. Um, I there's so much to, to talk about in that. But the one thing that I think is important to pick out of that is the power of fear. And one thing I've learned as a recovering addict is there is so much beauty when I don't live in fear. Most of, you know, crazy things that I used to do was because deep down inside, I felt like I didn't have a safe space, that I was unloved. Or if I was loved, I didn't believe I was loved. And that I needed to be perfect. And that's one thing that I've seen in work culture in general is uh, bosses, managers, um, expecting their employees to be perfect. Yet, that's what you said, expecting the boss being this kind of God where if you don't listen to me or if, if you try to do something better than me, like, oh, I don't like that idea. I do it this way. Instead, you're saying, no, I'm flexible because... I'm not always right. And that's the beauty of humility is, is knowing that you're not always right and being open. And sometimes, you know, you're like, I'm not right. Turned out the other person wasn't right either, you know, and, and there's love and grace around there. But it's hard to feel safe, whether as an employee or even as an employer, when you don't have grace, when you're not operating out of grace. And I don't mean that from a, a spirit, even a spiritual sense. I just mean in terms of allowing people to make mistakes. In fact, incorporating a farm business in a way where you're allowed to make mistakes. 
uh, on a business level where you're, if something happens, you know what, I, we didn't expect it, but we already planned for it. We got a budget for it, for broken items yeah. or lost items that you still can't find because they're out in the field somewhere. Um, you know, if there's a flat tire, you know, I have a budget for uh, maintenance repairs on vehicles and equipment, stuff like that. So I think even incorporating that on a uh, uh, quantitative sense can provide qualitative uh, experiences and examples. Um, so just thank you for, for being someone who operates out of grace and humility because it's, that's very hard to find. Uh, for people who are working a nine-to-five job, uh, it, hard to see that, you know, um, hard to see that even in my life. Uh, when I deal with other people, but one thing I've learned is when I show grace to folks, they appreciate me more. They're like, "What? You're not mad at me for doing that thing? You're, you're, you're actually giving me a second chance? What? What?" And then it, I believe, builds loyalty, builds confidence. So, oh, I, I can fail and not get fired the next day. Like, it's okay to fail as long as I'm learning. There's a difference between just failing for the sake of failing and continuing to fail versus failing, learning, and improving. Uh, and I do think even sometimes, especially when folks are trying to figure out farm employees or future farm leaders, I might not be the right farm for you. Whether your own individual personalities just doesn't mix no matter how much grace you can show. Or there might not be at a level of maturity. Or the farmer, you might not be at a level of maturity. So I just love that you brought that up because so many people have been hurt from bosses, managers, which is why you have a lot of people who are exiting out of big cities to go do homesteading and stuff like that. I was going to ask you about your other employees who are currently taking a lunch break. <laughs> <laughs> and I ask you, how, how have pigs on your farm uh, been special employees like how have they helped you your farm your farm family um and your business overall we tell people that the pigs are the hardest working employees on the farm and they don't even know it <laughs> so uh, i feel like for our farming operation looking at end goals of what we want um with our land base to go off that a little bit you know people uh, i hear the question how many pigs can i run on this acre and what's the amount of time and so on and so forth and i tell people you know i get asked that fa fairly often and you and me both yes sir yes sir <laughs> i can imagine and, and, and i tell people I, I can't answer that you know i can with some more details but it depends on what you want um and so what we do is we don't you know we don't use any rings we don't do any of those things um our hogs get to get to root they get to wallow um they're very very heavy um heavily impactful on the, on the landscape and so what we do is we put them in an area where they can do that and it it actually benefits that area and improves that area um, this is an area that they're in now that's been cleared mechanically but behind that uh, where they'll be moving to man it's overgrown it was logged a few years ago and so it's a lot of saplings and stuff would like to convert that over to silver pasture if i put these animals out in the middle of a pasture now they're going to be do uh, more disturbance and destruction than they are improvement and so it's not going to be a good scenario for either one of us. Um, they're not going to be, um, they're not going to be a benefit to the farm at that point. If you put them in an area like this, man, they get to go out, they get to root up these saplings, they get to wallow around, they get to do their thing and it improves the land base and helps move us toward the goal that we want. So that's kind of what I feel like is you, you hear the term with the pigs, you know, pigs are nasty. They're living in mud and all this and that. And it's, mm -hmm. th that's not the pig's fault. That's the farmer's fault. A amen. Every, every amen. single time. So keep preaching. It, it's, it's about having a system, a management system that sets your animals up to be successful as an enterprise um, by putting them in a scenario that they can be an improvement to your operation. Um, it, I would be super stressed if I had my pigs out in the pasture. I'd be like, I got to move these pigs like four times a day to keep them from, from doing more disturbance than what, what's necessary and what's improving. Uh, out here, man, you know, I mean, there's still very much a rhyme and a reason of when you move them and the, and the space that they get and so on and so forth, but they get to come out, you get to watch them, you get to watch them be happy and you get to watch them do what they're created to do and you get to feel good about it all while they're doing exactly what they were created to do and they feel good about it. So yeah, I feel like it's a, it's about management from the farmer and from, from the, uh, from the managers in that operation. 
uh, over a swan operation to do it that way. So, hey, Amen. Y'all, you got to manage your pigs like people with love and kindness yep. and plenty of food. Look at that. <laughs> plenty uh, of food. Uh, sir, sir, do you have some time to talk uh, to do an interview, sir? Sir, no, okay, he's too busy eating. <laughs> that's, that's what pigs do. I love that because it's putting the blame on on oneself, not the pigs. And that's kind of part of my story of, I, I thought, starting when I started raising pigs, that, oh, well, the pigs are breaking out and the pigs are breaking infrastructure. It's their fault. They're doing something wrong. Why, why do they keep doing these things? And then I had a come to Jesus moment with uh, a sow named Louise and uh, immediately realized that um, I'm the problem, not the pigs. And uh, so I love how you're not blaming the pigs for ruin pasture or ruin landscape but that you're saying okay i need to do something in terms of tightening my management better so that way they can be happy and so that way you can be happy um rather than how do i force pigs to do what i want them to do it more it's of a cooperation on your farm yeah. uh, so i think that's worked out really well uh there's not one part that i've seen on your farm that's like wow yikes <laughs> um, and if there was, we wouldn't be having this conversation. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, but I think it's just important for people who are getting into pig farming, especially to know that have grace for yourself. Um, you're going to make mistakes. And kind of like what we had mentioned earlier, um, there is no easy answer to how long pigs should stay on a piece of land or an increment of land. Uh, that factors that would influence that is soil type the weather (laughs) you know is it bone dry or has it been raining for two weeks straight you know uh the amount the breed of pigs you have some pigs are more disturbers than others oh by the way all pigs root i I want to hear y'all say oh well this breed don't root (laughs) they all do all right let's just make that clear um also how much your pig weighs right how many pigs you have and how much they weigh um, you know, there. It, what type of area are you in? Are you in the pasture or are you in um, a forest? You know, forest disturbance, you don't want pigs to be in uh, one area of forest for very too long. And you kind of don't want to return them back uh, because it, there's not a lot of light. Therefore, grass takes longer to grow back. Vegetation takes longer to grow back compared to an open field where they're getting all the sunlight they could ever want. And you can rotate them back in two months or three months or something like that. Yes, um, so I think it's just important that people break these legalistic misconceptions about pig farming on pasture uh, or you know pig farming outdoors. I will never say that I am 100% someone who agrees with pig farmers on pasture. I believe that you can raise pigs in the forest too. I believe in some cases you can raise pigs not in the pasture or in the forest. Right? It's just a matter of how you manage them in a way that's allowing pigs to be pigs. Um, and also that's allowing um, proper health and nutrition. So I want to talk about that uh, for a little bit. What does it mean for you to have healthy pigs? What does healthy pigs look like for you on the management level when it comes to feed, uh, when it comes to land management, uh, and when it comes to uh, dealing with temperaments and breeds? There's a few different factors. How well are they growing? You know, a healthy animal is going to grow well. A healthy animal is going to show you that that it feels good. It's going to be running around. It's going to be doing its thing. You know, um, antibiotic use is something that we we do not administer antibiotics unless an animal needs it. There's no feed grade antibiotics. We don't you know routinely administer them, and so we can use that metric of how often do we have to do that. Um, on our farming operation you know if an animal gets sick it's going to be the same thing i'm responsible i'm the steward of that animal amen if i don't treat it with the resources that i have available and it has to suffer because of that then that's my fault i'm i'm not a a good steward if, if i make that decision so it takes more intensive practice on the front end to make sure that they're rotated regularly that you're not having you know parasitic issues and that you're not having that you're not putting them in an environment that they're more susceptible. It's cleaning your feeders. It's doing things like that. It's making sure that they have a well-balanced uh, ration so that they have the nutrients that they need to stay healthy. They're just like us. I mean, if you eat well and, you, and you're living in a clean environment and you're doing what you need to be doing, your chances of getting sick, you know, they go down. So um, performance for us with breeds, you know, what we've done is <laughs> you get a real good friend there. Um, 
we 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 seek feedback from uh, end users, and we're, we're we're very blessed to be able to work with some great butcher shops, and they can give us direct feedback on carcass quality, on you know uh, everything from fat ratios, just what what we're doing and what they are receiving as the end product. Um, so that gives us a lot of influence on our decision making for. Um, the breeds that we'll select, the genetics within that breed. Uh, because, you know, a Berkshire pig is not just a Berkshire pig. There's a lot of different genetics in that, and that goes for any of the breeds. And honestly, we, we have used the breeds that we have because we've been successful with them. And when, I, when we talk breeds with other farmers, you know, that's not something... I'll, I can tell you what I've been successful with. I can't tell you what you're going to be successful with. Mm -hmm. Your operation is going to depend on the decisions that you make and your end goals and, and how you choose to get there. Um, I can tell you what we've not been successful with and what we have been and, you know, reflect on those, on those decisions that we've made and, and figure out if that'll work for your operation and, and what breeds to select and what, you know, feed to, to, um, offer your pigs and, and how to do that. And a lot of stuff that we've learned, man, it's easy to, to, to walk in and be like, man, this is great. This is so awesome. I can look at it just like I have from years past and say, man, this is way better than it was. But by no means would I ever want somebody to, to think, you know, that, and we've, you've got, we started off on day one with selecting breeds and selecting genetics and <laughs> getting, you know. Yeah. You uh, want to stretch yourself out. Go do that. Yeah. We're, I mean, we're, we're doing, uh, we've got several different rations that we feed now. And when we started with pigs, we found pigs. On Craigslist, we bought the pigs. We went to southern states after that and said, what do we need to feed these guys? And we went from there. And so uh, a, a huge learning curve. Um, life's a three-legged stool. If you want to be successful with anything, training, education, and experience. And there's only one way to get that experience, and that's just by doing it or by learning from others that have done it in the past. And, you know, there's a reason we have two ears and one mouth. Listen to them. Um, so yeah, just, just measuring those metrics is, um, it, it's, it's a little bit different with each different pork enterprise. So a lot of it again is with weight gain and how we're doing with that. But you know, with farrowing, how many piglets is she giving us per parity? There's a lot of different things. We're not as specific with breed. There's certain ones that we choose that choose not to use just because we're not sure that they would work well for our operation and the feedback again that we get from those consumers that handle the product directly we're more selective of their performance as opposed to the breed and especially with our sows we farrow on pasture and so having a sow that is going to be she's calm enough and docile that we can go and we can handle the piglets if, if anything happens and we can work with them but they may be out in the middle of the woods away from everything and responsible for protecting that litter. There's no crates. There's there's nothing. Uh, the mother is responsible for being considerate and um, being aware of her piglets being there too. So that's more of what we're selected for, as opposed to uh, just any specific breed or or anything within the breed or pork world in general, I guess. So. See y'all. This is why I came to his farm <laughs> because uh, he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> and uh, I remember the first time I came to his farm, and I was like good guy came back a second time a, a couple weeks ago right yes sir yeah and uh i asked him some hard questions like, like technical pig questions this man answered them <laughs> flawlessly asked him about estrus asked him about gestation asked him about what type of feed asked him a whole lot of questions and he he proved himself to be a very knowledgeable <laughs> pig farmer which i love to hear because uh, there are a lot of pig farmers who especially those who are starting out who kind of just bs yeah. things and just say things and they're like i'm not sure or this is what i saw on youtube from some famous guy or whatever and um i've seen how that can be problematic for a lot of people who are wanting to get into um raising pigs this is part of why i created pork rind tv was so that way we can have experienced farmers <laughs> um be able to uh share their stories their context and for people to be able to glean information, I don't believe that Aaron is, that you are the god of pig farmers, right? I don't believe Absolutely anybody is. Absolutely not. You know, but I believe that your experiences are important and that your experience can give someone insight into their operation currently or their future operation. And so I like giving people options in that. And so you are one amazing option for people who can glean and pick. All right, so I don't have to worry about breed. 
a lot of people think breed's important. And not that there isn't an importance to breed, but when you talk about my end goal is not really the breed. We're not here to do breed uh, conservation here. We're here to produce a particular uh, product of pork, quality of pork, um, that works for your market. And so I like the fact that you're focusing on the end goal, which is not necessarily the breed, which is a not a trivial issue, but more so a secondary issue compared to what are your end goals? And can your selection of the breed or even type of pig be able to meet those goals and your production needs? There's more to learn every day. I mean, that's that's the one thing that you got to realize is there's so much more to learn today and tomorrow than there was yesterday. You know, and the minute that you think you have it figured out that, yeah, that's keep learning, keep <laughs> learning. <laughs> we, we talked about family and how important family is. And uh, I know a lot of my viewers, y'all got kids, spouses, stuff like that. Uh, talk about how farming has changed your family, and some of the hardships that you had to go through in order to experience that growth. Man, I, I, for the family, I, I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade a bit of it. The the farm life, man. What we're able to do together and seeing each other, and uh, you know, our little boy's ten months old. It's the that is the most incredible thing uh, to see my wife be able to mother him every single day and not have to leave him. And and man, it's like every day for lunch, we're there. You know, I can walk at any point that I want. I could walk into the house and see my family or, you know, they can be out here with us or what, whatever it may be. It's, 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 that is such a blessing. We talk about, um, your, your question with hardships and, um, you know, maybe some growing pains with it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie. It's a struggle knowing, uh, going back to, uh, the question about farming full time and, and that end goal, you know, when there's times when, you know, you're going on a family vacation or you're the rest of your family is, you know. Um, whether it be my parents, her parents, whoever it may be, or friends or somebody, and they're going to, it could be a concert, it could be anything, and you know you got something to do on the farm. That could be like, that. that's a, a personal sacrifice that you just have to decide to make together as a family. And there's sometimes that it's harder for one than the other. Um, but just, just, you know, having situations like that, knowing that that end goal is something that we've decided on together, makes it worth it. Because I, I don't think... Uh, I, I can certainly tell you my wife and I, you know, through some of those growing pains, you know, of course there's times where we would disagree or, you know, it, it may be, uh, something where one would get really disappointed because we wanted to go do something and the other one would know that we couldn't because, uh, either one of us had something going on with the farming operation, but I can't imagine now that we would, we'd probably done it tenfold, missed out on absolutely everything to be where we're at with the family dynamic now and with, with being able to, for both of us to be able to be here on the farm uh, and raising our little boy. I mean, there's no way that we would, we would trade that. There's no way. There's not a vacation that you could send us on. There's not a trip. There's nothing that we would have, have done uh, that we would trade for that. So, By the way, his boy is adorable. <laughs> oh my gosh. He is so adorable. Um, yeah. I, I love that. As someone who, um, you know, will eventually go back into farming, uh, who wants to get married and have children one day, uh, I love hearing about why family is so important and that there are always going to be sacrifices that need to be made, but that the sacrifices can be worth it. Uh, talk about that fine line between it being worth it and it not being worth it. Yeah. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, doing something on the farm. Ooh. Uh, that you feel like, oh, well, if we spent more time doing this or, or if we pivot this way or if we put more money into this towards the farm, how you've had to make compromises and say, you know what, not right now. I need to focus on the family one way or another. Talk about that. So for us, when we started farming and knew that we wanted to farm full time, that was the, the biggest motivation was to be able to raise our kids on the farm. And I mean, there are times that, uh, you know, don't don't ever get it wrong that a full-time farmer gets to make their own schedule and all that. There's flexibility, no doubt, but there's still a lot of things that, that dictate what you have to do that day. Um, to, to grow the business, there's times that you have to capitalize on opportunity and that you have to do things and that, you know, you may rather be, you know, hanging out with family or something than, than doing what needs to be done right then and there. But if you do that all the time, what's the point, you know? Because if the point is to raise your family on a farm 
man, you could go somewhere else and, and maybe make some more money or something or, or, or find something else that might be a lot easier and never see your family too. It, it, it's the whole point, you know, for me is to be with my family and to raise them here on the farm. And if you're going to work the entire time and not, not spend that time with family, then what's the point of it is, is kind of the way that we view it. I've been bad about that in the past. I mean, there's been times that, you, you know, they're, they're in bed for several hours. You're rolling at two or three in the morning or something like that. And, and you're just doing what's got to be done, but it's a lot easier to now, especially with us having, um, having our, our little boy to, uh, to say, man, we're, this is, this is more important. This will be here tomorrow. This is something that I could do. And you know, growing up that happens fast. That happens. Everybody tells you how fast it's going to happen. And it happens even faster than that. You know, that's the thing that having that balance of knowing, um, knowing that that stuff will be there tomorrow, but there's also going to be times that you do need to capitalize on the then and there. You've got to make those decisions, and th and that comes with time. The, the wisdom to make that decision comes with time, I feel like, um, as you're doing it. The the other big thing that I would say, too, is, you know, um, if if Nicole would have been adamantly against us farming full-time or if I would have been adamantly against us farming full-time, I think both of us, you know, our marriage is more important than any, any career that we're going to have. And parenthood one, one more time now. <laughs> our marriage is way more important than than anything that we're ever going to do as a career or any job or anything so knowing that is something that you have to understand that farming people talk about it being a lifestyle and all that and it, and it very much is a really really deep commitment you know you you in in a lot of cases are going to live where you work and so on and so forth but it's still a career and I wouldn't encourage anybody to make a career decision that it's going to be detrimental to their family in, in any circumstance. You know, you're going to be married to that person, uh, should be no matter what you're doing, you know. And you're going to be that person's, uh, that child's mother or father, regardless of what you're doing for a living. So you need to make those decisions based off of your family first is the way that I feel. I wouldn't get into farming if I knew that my wife is going to be miserable because of it or that my children wouldn't, wouldn't grow up in a better spot. And, you know, and I don't, I, she wouldn't do that either. So, you know, that's the thing is a big reason, um, that we are able to grow, have been able to grow our business and that we both farm full time is because we're, we're both on the same page with it. And we both know that that brings us happiness. Um, if, if, if it's going to, bring dismay and, and, you know, uh, stress and discomfort to your marriage or your personal life or something, you got to really kind of evaluate, is this really worth it? Can I still be involved with agriculture or something that I'm passionate about, you know, and, and it not cost these things? Cause in my, in my, uh, mind and in my life, my, my marriage and, and my fatherhood are, are more important to me than anything that I'm going to do as a career. Hey man, hey man. <laughs> Yeah, um, it, it's really sad when there are so many people who go into farming and agriculture, even homesteading, and uh, they might have the idea of, of well, I'm doing this for the family, doing this for my spouse, doing this for my kids, you know, and the very thing that they're trying to do for their loved ones ends up being the very thing that detaches them from their loved one, whether it's divorce, whether it's uh, the kids never coming back. Um, whether it's uh, being in a loveless marriage or not having uh, uh, any intimacy with your children. Um, I I've seen it. I've seen a lot of that, especially in farming, and not a lot of people talking about that. So just first of all, thank you for answering the question because um, yes, that's sir. part of this channel that I want to highlight is it's not just about farming. Um, there is so much more of life around farming, but when we make farming a god, an idol in our life, we end up losing the very things that uh, we put before it um, or put below it, you know? So if you're putting wife and kids below farming, then you're going to lose wife and kids. Um, and it might not be a, a physical loss. It might be a spiritual, emotional, mental loss um, or detachment from them. And so... Thank you for sharing your story, um, and thank you for being honest and saying, man, I made mistakes, and I've done this and done that, uh, because a lot of men especially need to hear that. Uh, so I want to ask you, as a man, as a brother in Christ, um, how have you grown as a man, um, I dare say man of God, through farming, through perseverance in farming, 
through loving your wife, surrendering to your wife, surrendering to the needs of your child? How have you grown as a man uh, in that? And how's it been challenging? You know, what have you what have you lost in order to do that? Well, uh, one, one thing about the last question that I'd like to close on too is, you know, at the end of the day, I would rather the day that I that I die, I would rather people say that I was a, a wonderful husband and a wonderful father and a horrible farmer. Excuse me. I would rather people say, you know, hey, man, I was a loving husband. I was a great husband. I was a great father and a horrible farmer than have it the other way around. I, I would, you know, that would, I would, that would be such failure to me. I could be an awesome farmer, but if I'm not a great husband, if I'm not those aren't the most important relationships in my life, then I, I could care less. You know, I, I don't, I'm not doing what I want to do on this earth. I can tell you that, but talking about growing, growing his family, um, as a husband, uh, as a father, as a, as a, you know, son of God, as a child of God, you know, as a Christian farming really puts in my mind, what we are called to do firsthand. Um, it puts it in front of me every day, you know, um, we're, we're called to be stewards and, you know, we're, we're, you know, the, the love of money is the root of all evil. And that's a, that's a thing that you're, you're given opportunities every day with farming to be a good steward of the earth or to make a bad decision and, and chase money and, and be, you know, I could, there's plenty of things that you could do in farming to say that you're doing something to make more money. Man, it, it that is like run away from that. Amen. Run away. Keep preaching. You know. Uh, it, it, that's something that to be out here in creation and to see all of the things perfectly placed as they have been and to be able to, to oversee and manage and steward these things, man, that is such a blessing. And, and it really creates a deeper sense of appreciation of all the blessings that you do have, you know, because that's one of the things that farming does allow is a little bit slower pace where you could slow down and really appreciate the things that you have before you. You know, uh, to be able to, yeah, it's, it's 10 something on a, on a Tuesday. We're out here sitting in a, in, man, we're, we're seeing creation right in front of us. We're seeing the things that big old creation, big old creation. Yeah. But it's like, you know, you're, you're, we're out here in the middle of the woods and man, it's, it's a beautiful time of year. There's a lot of great things going on. You get to be a part of it. You get to slow down and you get to appreciate those things. And to me, I mean, that just, that brings my walk closer every day. So beautiful answer, beautiful answer. So I have one more question and we're going to wrap it up. Um, you know, it's since COVID-19 or the plague, just going to call it that. Um, there have been a lot of, oh, he's going to smell a butt again. You going to smell a butt again? All right, there we go. Um, there's been a lot of isolation. Farmers are already isolated as it is, especially westernized agricultural productions. Yeah. Um, and then add COVID-19, the plague into that. And some people haven't really had human to human interactions in, since it started, you know, a lot of the conferences that were in person that people would, would block out their calendars for that was their vacation to go to yeah. went virtual and that was their opportunity for community. So, you know, talk about, you know, what it means to be sane, and living in community, how community keeps you sane. Not just your farming community, but the community outside of farming and developing community outside of farming, even the church. Man, uh, I'll tell you one of the most refreshing things for me that I saw was the Homesteaders uh, Association, the, uh, the conference that they had, and just seeing great people come together. The one I spoke at? Yes, sir. <laughs> You're familiar with it. Yes, yeah. sir. I mean, just seeing the group of people that came together, to me, that was so refreshing because it's like, man, all these things that, I, my, right or wrong, I tell people, just throw your TV out, you know, turn it off. There's so much good going out. There's so much good going on in the world. There are so many good things. I, this, the pandemic's awful. I mean, it's awful. It is very much a, a horrible thing, and we're all trying to figure out how to make our way through it. Um, there's so many different decisions to make, and no matter what you do, somebody's going to tell you you're wrong for something. And, and you know what? There's There's... There is so much more good than there is bad going on in the world still today. And what we're doing is what I truly believe is meaningful work as farmers. All of us are. And it's not a competition against each other. It's a competition 
uh, in my mind, it's a, you know, going back to the leadership thing, it's a competition of being better than who we were yesterday. And if, if I don't care who you are as a farmer, man, bring the, bring, bring the rest of us up, bring the, bring your, your fellow men and women up, encourage each other, no, no, learn from each other, support each other. I mean, it is, it's a very different thing. And, you know, before Nicole and I, uh, during her pregnancy last year, you know, we were, we were not traveling much at all. We weren't really doing anything. And, and you, we didn't really realize how, I guess, secluded things had become, um, until we started to go back toward a more normal, uh, scenario, I guess. And so, yeah, it was just, just knowing that, man, it's still the good life that it was for you to be able to farm before as it is now. You know, I mean, all those, it's still there. So I feel like I've given you a horrible answer to this one. <laughs> what do y'all think? You think he gave me a horrible answer to that question? I don't think so. Um, yeah. Well, dude, so, uh, hey, first of all, I love you. I appreciate man, you. Same to you. I love you too, brother. Um, so, uh, you know, um, first, I uh, want to do a... A quick spill and say that uh, Aaron has sought me so much just by him doing his regular thing um, and being able to conversate with him and hear his vulnerability, hear how he's still trying to figure out, you know, what does it mean for me to be successful on the farm? This guy's got success where most people would say, I would stop there. But Aaron's still pushing on. Um, he's not being stagnant. He's wanting to grow. And that inspires me, uh, as I go on my own journey, um, you know, and eventually going back into farming. I love being around people like you because it reminds me that I should never settle for a point where I say, okay, everything's comfortable now. I've reached achievement and accomplishment and I want to put my hat on this and we're done. But instead you're saying, I know that tomorrow can change in an instant. And I need to be flexible with that. But part of being flexible is working those muscles, already being flexible as an operation, and doing that on a daily basis. So I just appreciate you doing that. Um, I, I, and that he didn't pay me to say any of this stuff. <laughs> um, you know, but it, it shows what good leadership looks like. And I think a lot of farmers, especially those who are wanting um, employees in the future, I dare say leaders, People who are going to develop more leaders in this farming space um, who need to learn that, you know, and part of doing that is already practicing that within yourself. So thank you for your leadership. Uh, so uh, just a quick, you know, if you had anything to say to, to the audience um, to uh, uh, don't have a name for this for y'all yet. So if you've got any names, comment below, um, you know, but to my following subscription base, what, what are some words of encouragement that you can give to them? So it's a, it's a lot bigger than any individual. It's a lot bigger than what we're doing here and, and being part of, of a bigger movement is very much what we hope to be a part of, you know, encouraging others, helping others, man. And, and like I said, there's so many different things that I look back on when I thought I might've had something figured out, made some progress and man, it's it, learn to laugh at yourself because if you're not doing that, yeah, you're not learning, you're not growing, you're not moving forward. Uh, learn to laugh at yourself and, and learn every single day as much as you can. Keep your ears open, learn from others, be humble, uh, and know that that is going to bring you to a spot that you're going to you're going to be better than you were yesterday. Uh, the more humility that you're willing to to display and vulnerability, and just knowing that, man, I don't have it figured out. Uh, that's going to get you. That's going to get you a lot further than you know thinking that you that you that you do. And I could speak that very much from experience. I can laugh at myself and say, man, there are so many things that, boy, I was wrong. I was wrong. And I learned that one the hard way. So yeah, I mean, keep your ears open, keep listening to extremely smart gentlemen like this one. And yeah, just, uh, just keep expanding your resource base and keep growing. Awesome. I love it. I love it. So, uh, Aaron, how can people get a hold of you? I'm pretty sure your phone's going to start blowing up or something like that. <laughs> uh, but how can people uh, get a hold of you, whether or not they maybe want to try your pork yeah. or they might want some uh, feeder pigs if you will and sell them a couple? Yes, sir. You know, how can, uh, you know, trying to help out the business here, <laughs> um, how can uh, they get a hold of you? 
So we have a website. It's uh, colfaxcreekfarm.com. That's C-O-L-F-A-X creekfarm.com. Uh, we're on Instagram at Colfax Creek Farm and Facebook. Uh, you can find our contact information there. You can go to our website. Uh, we've got e-commerce on there. You can. Uh, it's got the option to send us a message if you have any specific request for anything. Um, if you want to talk pigs, my email is on the website. Please hit me up and we'll, we'll discuss a time to talk about our farm and operation and how we could be a help to anybody. And he also does uh, tours and other events on his farm, uh, whether soloing it or working with his local county extension. Uh, so definitely email about that as well for whenever he does the next farm uh, tour or program. And I'm going to be working with him on uh, <laughs> on scheduling some stuff, uh, some high dollar stuff. So we be on the lookout for that. we got some fun stuff coming up, yeah. Um, you know, so um, I guess other than that... Um, uh, I'd love to pray for you if that's okay. Yes, yeah, please. And um, that, cool, cool. Yes, sir. All right, please. Perfect. Uh, Heavenly Father, just thank you for 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 life and creation, God. Uh, I, I just thank you, Lord, that we get to live another day, um, even though the day's not promised to us. Uh, I pray that um, we would just grow in admiration in you. Uh, and in perseverance of understanding what it means to live in a difficult life in a difficult world, Lord, uh, even as pigs are sniffing our boots. Um, but God, I also just pray that um, you would protect Aaron and his family, that you would continue to encourage uh, his family, both in your spirit as well as in um, uh, as in the community that surrounds him. Uh, thank you that I get to be a part of his community, Lord. I pray that uh, uh, I continue to be a blessing in his life just as much as he's, he's been a blessing in my life. Um, and also just pray for his farm business, uh, for his family, Lord. And I just pray that uh, he would continue to lift those things up to you, um, to put himself second to um, all the things that he might want to do, Lord, so that way he can give you glory and honor, and that that glory and honor would be returned back to him, Lord, uh, through the prosperity of, of being in your grace. I pray all these things in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. So, Aaron, you know, just for like promo sake and stuff like that, if you, uh, what kind of rec, if you had to recommend anyone uh, to pork rind, right? Or if you want to recommend pork rind to anyone, what what would you say? What would you say? I'm just I'm just curious, just curious. You got another hour? <laughs> <laughs> I got two. I got a minute or two. Go for it. No, I mean, the the experience that you have and the knowledge base that you have, and I, you know, we joke about an hour. We probably need about ten or twelve to get started. Um, <laughs> I mean, how well traveled are you? How how many different enterprises have you seen? And just knowing. That like we we talk in so many different conversations about uh, context and and that's one of the things for you having been exposed to so many different swine operations, not just nationally but internationally, and being able to work with farmers and work with producers that are trying to expand or trying to get into a specialized uh, operation or anything that they may be. Um, be venturing after you're able to take your expertise and experience and really hone in on what their context may be and what fits for them and really lead them in a direction that's going to help them be successful. And so, I mean, you've done that with us. I see you doing that with so many others. I mean, it is, yeah, I, I, I it's a blessing to be sitting here with you. I'm abs. I feel absolutely honored. I mean, this is awesome. So yeah, you, you doing what you're doing is, uh, Man, you're you're doing some awesome stuff, and and I know you've mentioned a couple times that you're not farming right now. You are very much in a way farming. You're helping so many other farmers. You may not be growing an animal right now yourself, but you're helping so many, and you're influencing so many in a positive way that are doing that right now. And there's a lot of people that can't do what you do. So, and keep it up, keep it up, buddy. You're doing some awesome, very meaningful work. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, I love you, brother. I appreciate it. I love you too, you. man. Thank you. Thank you. All right, y'all. Uh, this concludes our uh, episode. And, um, yeah, go go, go, go! follow him on the social medias. Uh, go buy pics from him. Uh, give him money. And um, I look forward to chatting with y'all. If y'all have any comments, questions, thoughts, concerns, or if you want anyone else uh, to be a part of the Pork Ryan TV episodes, just put them, put them in the comments. Let me know. Like, subscribe, all that other random stuff that's important. Um, and uh, let me know what you think. Other than that, I hope you all have a good one. And, uh, again, thank you so much, Aaron. I appreciate you. Thank you. 
that we were the last la, 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 designed to live in at la, 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 designed to <laughs> uh, with um you can edit you can edit this I think right all right so they need to be have have that you know and they can't my butt's, my butt's getting <laughs> sniffed <laughs> we uh, we uh, lost track of what we were talking about um so uh